All right. So I think well, we're live now. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, everyone. This is the next episode of Head in the Clouds. Uh, I'm Michael Gibbs. I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Careers. I have with me my extremely good friend, Alonzo Coleman. Many of you know him. He's a fantastic cloud architect, as well as cloud program manager. And of course, we've got my chief operating officer, Chris, who's also a good friend. And he's here to make sure that Alonzo and I, who will have all kinds of fun, don't run off on all kinds of wacky tangents because people that know me know that once we find something fun, I'm going to go run with it. People that know Alonzo, he'll do the same thing and the two of us to get together. That's just a scary combination. So Chris is here to make sure that everything gets done. We cover what we're supposed to because today we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk about hybrid cloud architectures. We're going to talk about the OpenStack cloud. We'll talk about the Nutanix cloud. I mean, this is going to be some heavy duty cloud architecture career development while we're having fun, talking about science, technology, all kinds of cool things, hybrid clouds, multi-clouds, hybrid cloud, multi-clouds, all kinds of stuff, the strengths and weaknesses, and it's going to be a fun time, party time. So if you're here, type, actually, you know what, type hashtag cloud architect and hashtag cloud hired. You know, those two things make me happy. And then uh, while you guys are doing that, I'll let you know about some exciting things that we have for everybody. And then after that, we'll get the show started. So let me know, let you know about a few things tomorrow. Guess what? We're going to offer you some free interview coaching. We're going to come online. We will interview you. You can watch other people interview you. And we will in watch other people interview you. And you'll really get to see how people interview and if you know yourself and you know your competition, guess what? Guess what? If you know yourself and not your competition, for every win, there'll be one loss. If you, if you know your competition and not yourself, for every win, there's one loss. And if you don't know your interview skills or your competition's interview skills, guess what? You're almost always going to lose. So win, win, win. Win first and go to war. Build a plan. Execute that plan and succeed. So we're going to give you a chance to do some free and live interview coaching tomorrow. We've been interviewing people forever. I've interviewed over 5,000 candidates. And quite frankly, I've never been on an interview for which I didn't get hired. So not only have I researched interviews for the last 25 years and tactics and spent thousands and thousands of hours on this, we love it. It's fun. So join us for the free interview coaching tomorrow. The link is in the description below. So it's all free. Guess what? To help you all build your careers, we're going to offer a completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect Boot Camp on April 12th to April 16th. It's going to be live. It's going to be free. It's going to be a real classroom where, you know, you come in, you watch videos, and you can ask questions. It'll be live on YouTube Live. You'll be able to ask questions. We love to do like 20 minutes of, quest uh, of teaching and 10 minutes of questions to make sure you get the best cloud computing training and experience, and it's all free, so please register. Last thing that I'll talk about is I'm a little celebration still. I'm still in celebration mode. I've been doing this helping people get their first tech job or get promoted thing for two decades now. And I've always loved it. But a year ago, we created our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. And there's not a day that goes by where somebody doesn't say, Mike, I just got cloud hired and it really makes me happy. I know Chris smiles every time. I know even Alonzo smiles every time. We love every time one of our students gets hired. So because I, I lost count of how many students got hired this year, it was just too many. And that makes me super exciting. We're giving 30% off for the next two weeks. So if you want to get your first cloud architect job, take advantage of this. If you're looking for an interview preparation, we've got interview training. And guess what? If you're already a cloud architect and you want to be a distinguished architect, guess what? We've even got a tech career accelerator program for you. So no matter what your goal is and what your career is, 30% off for the next two weeks. So now we'll get back to the show. Chris, uh, you kick off the show. All right. So now I'm, I'm back in charge. And uh, we'll make sure we stay on track a little bit. Um, just to make sure everyone is aware, Alonzo uh, has had an interesting week so far. <laughs> so Alonzo, Alonzo had some dental surgery yesterday. Um, so we're going to be trying to alleviate some of his, his, uh, his talking, but I don't know how much that's going to work. Uh, <laughs> Probably not a lot, you know, I'll, I'll pay for it later, but it'll be worth the conversation. <laughs> right, right. And uh, he's also dealing with some pretty strong windstorms out there in Texas. So if you see Alonzo disappear, don't don't worry. It's just the wind. You know, it's like Dorothy and Kansas. Power, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
A but, lot of uh, unfortunately does not live in a five nines data center with two power companies and generators and backup generators and UPS systems like a data center. So, you know, we could be taken down any time by a power. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I got a single point um, here. <laughs> But yeah, so to uh, to give everyone an idea of what we're going to talk about today, so we're going to talk about the cloud computing community, what it's like for Mike and Alonzo to be a part of the community, and uh, what it means to them, and what they get out of it. Uh, you know, it's a it, they're they are in unique positions um, to be able to to take part and give back, and uh, and we're going to hear a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about the big topic, of course, is uh, OpenStack and Nutanix and private clouds and all that fun stuff. Um, and then we'll also talk about uh, a topic that came up last week that we said we were gonna talk about a little bit more. We'll talk about how to handle difficult situations or, or delicate situations when dealing with clients or customers. And, um, and then we'll have a, have a fun time with uh, with everyone in the chat box. Um, you know, if the time allows, we'll uh, we'll take questions from the uh, from the chat box, but they need to be questions that you've always wanted to ask Mike, me, or Alonzo. They can't be questions that you've asked before in in a in a class in the cloud architect career development program. Or a question that you've you've asked, uh, you know, in, in, in a YouTube chat before. It's got to be a unique question. So give that give that some thought. What's the question that you've always wanted to ask one of us, and and we'll we'll answer them. So if you've got some flexibility. If you want to ask what my cat Cindy eats for breakfast, for example, go <laughs> ahead. We're are out there. We want to let you know, give you a chance to basically ask what you've always wanted to ask as opposed to the usual, which you know me, is how do you get hired, which I'm always thrilled to talk about, but I'm online a couple times a week for that, and you know how to find me. Yeah, but if you're new and you've never been here before and you want to ask how to get hired, we'll take That's that question too. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, so let's get started. Um, we'll start, well, I'll start with you, Mike, and so because you've been, uh, been part of this community for quite a while now. Um, I said I was gonna ask about your experience in the cloud computing community, but I guess I'll start off with your experience in the in the tech community or the networking community because you've been a part of the community before there was the cloud like we know it today. So, yeah, so. Uh, so, so share with us what, what your experience has been like and you know what, what it was like when you started, um, things that you might've seen change, uh, what it's like now. Uh, I do remember when I first started in tech, I had this 300 baud modem, 300 bit per second. And let me tell you, that was the worldwide weight as we used to call it. Uh, but no, seriously, when I first went into serious tech, it was like 1996 and I was working on my first cloud, which was Frame Relay and ISDN. And these were two networking clouds that were out there. Our clouds were just networks and today's clouds are the same networks plus data centers, but really nothing else has changed. And everything was so complex. Chris, what it was like is we'd try and install this little frame relay circuit, which would be this 56K lease line, which would cost like five grand a month. And it would never work out right. You'd go to install it and the line would come out, but the frame relay circuit wouldn't go. And it was a nightmare. So it didn't work. But, you know, we'd sit there, we'd take teams of people, we'd find ways to get things work. And then we had this technology ISDN, International Switch Digital Network. And basically it was like a phone switch. You could just connect on demand without, a, and it was really cool technology, but it was so unreliable that people used to call it, I still don't know. And all of us were sitting in a room debugging these Q921 and Q931 messages, which were the phone company signals, Caragung, on hook and off hook and the parts of the dial. So it was really ugly. But what I'll tell you, this was in the beginning, the tech people, we, we had fun. It was all freaks and geeks in those days. It was the people that, you know, in their hobbies, they were building radios or they were building spaceships in their hobbies. Everybody really worked together and it was cool. In the beginning, the tech was so weak that imagine writing software that had to run on 16 megahertz or a 10 megahertz CPU 
or a megabyte of RAM or even less than a megabyte of RAM. Our routers had like 16 megabytes of RAM in it. So the people that wrote the routing code on these routers had to be so good. And we needed teams of like thousands of people to run a data center because, you know, we didn't have server virtualization, you know, 25 years ago for the most part. And our servers only had one or two cores in it. So we had data centers the size of football fields that would take up an entire building. We'd be running around like crazy people in data centers that were like 50 degrees because the tech didn't even work. But so it was constant break, fix, break, fix, break, fix, break, fix, break, fix. And in those days, you could really build your career if you're one of the freaks and geeks. And in the beginning, I took advantage of that because I loved being the freaks and geeks for the first year or two until I learned that was the limitation of my career. But we all went out together. We all worked at big internet service providers. We shared information like you can't even imagine. You'd be at Cisco calling your buddy at Riverstone Networks. Hey, how's this stuff work? And they were fierce competitor organizations, but the people were just, there was so much camaraderie. And it, had, it was just a beautiful time. Now, what I'll tell you, as time progressed, the technology got a lot easier. And it worked a lot more. And as it worked together and it was better and it used, people didn't need to work together as closely. And when that occurred, then all of a sudden we started having our silos. Your networking people, your server people, your admin of your server people your security people, your operations people, your database people, and we all, and none of us really even talked to each other except for the architects because everybody was so focused on doing their job. So it lost a lot of the fun. And what happened is computing power got stronger. We no longer had one gigahertz core. We now have, you know, 128 or 256, three gigahertz cores. So now we've got much more, much more capacity our applications don't need to be as tightly written so we can be a little sloppier. And we are sloppier if you look at today's code versus the old code. But the funness is kind of gone. And I still love the tech and I love building the community. I've basically built a new community of you know frontline leading architects to do what we all did in the old days, work together, created a family and supported each other throughout our careers. So I will say it's been fun the whole time. But those early days when things were really complex, in order to survive it, we had to form such close bonds with each other, which I really, really love. And I still have friends from those old days. In fact, I had Andrea Kaza on the show one day. That was from 20 some years ago. I had Daryl Proctor. He was like the first architect of the architects. And you know what? He was figuring that stuff out 23 years ago. I had, uh, who else did I have recently? I had, uh, I had Alvin DaCosta on the show. Who, and I'll tell you what, he and I, we were the people that were starting to go build that architecture sort of community. And we were taking steps back, looking at the big picture. He trained and mentored hundreds of people. I trained and mentored thousands of people. But that's what we used to do in those days. In today's world, I don't see most people out there really doing a lot of mentoring. I don't see those people, you know, tutoring a lot of people just for fun. I wish that was still there. That's how we created such great technology professionals in those days. Yeah, so I'm gonna switch over to Alonzo here because I gotta, from my outside perspective, the thing that you just kind of touched on a little bit is kind of how we got Alonzo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch over to Alonzo and hear what Alonzo has to say about being a part of the community. Obviously his is a little bit different. He's uh, he hasn't been in, in, in this industry for, you know, 20, 25 years. So let's, uh, I'll pass it to you, Alonso, and let us, let us know what, what it's like for you. Okay. Um, again, if you guys don't remember where my uh, original first career stemmed from, it was stemmed from the other side of the brain. It was more of the marketing creative spectrum doing advertising for commercials, products, all sorts of cool things. And I got tired of it. You, you go through the burnout. I was doing that for a very, very long time. So I initially started my interest, my trek into the cloud space through digital uh, software, understanding how to meet the market where they are, be able to get those metrics so that you can change, add, or um, adjust as necessary to meet your, your market share. So 
I really started to appreciate what was going on, how that data was being handled in the cloud or where they said it was, you know, like, well, what's that? What's the cloud? It's like, so I wanted to figure more about what that was. So as I started transitioning out of marketing into project management and therewith into uh, the cloud space, one thing that I did not, I found lots of people who wanted to help me pass the exam. I found lots of people who had the, the silver bullet, if you will, to try to, okay, you can pass this. If you spend 12 minutes of your time going through all these videos, you can pass this certification and you can get this $16 million an hour job. So, you know, of course, you know, it didn't, it wasn't realistic, you know, <laughs> but I still wanted to find a resource where I can understand what the cloud was. So after an extensive amount of time going through coursework and I went through some, and some pretty interesting, you know, courses I found, but at the end of the day, I asked myself, how is it that I'm going to be getting this very expensive, high demand, reputable job by passing a course, and I'm not knocking you Demi for it, but I'm going to pay $50 for this course, but all of a sudden I'm going to get a six-figure salary. Come on, that's not going to make any sense. So I started researching and researching and researching, trying to find out what this was. And so I dug and I, I got, I basically I arrived to um, a choice of either doing Microsoft, uh, Azure, uh, AWS, or uh, Google Cloud Platform. And I thought, you know, uh, at the time, um, AWS was just canvassing everything. It's just nothing but AWS. And then they have a background in, uh, you know, Amazon for their services, you know, and their products. So I said, you know what, let's go with something that's popular, that's that's really driving the market. So I drove, you know, dove in at first to AWS and it was just too much, man. It was so much information. And the more I learned, the more services that they put out there, the more extra features that they already added to an already robust platform. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. And so I'm starting to look at this management console that I'd finally figured out what to do. And I'm patting myself on the back. Yay, I, I uh, spun up some S, S3s S and, 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 and some S2s. And I was able to ping myself. And, and I thought I was the man. I mean, I was like, this is great stuff. You know, I'm finally doing it. All to find out that that was just the tip of the iceberg. And so I needed someone to help me with this. I needed to find out where I need needed to go, how I could get this stuff done. What was the process for me to be a capable, respected uh, architect who understood this and could be and, and could interpret this and translate this to someone who had no idea, to the layman, if you will. And I struggled to find someone who could help me. I struggled, struggled, struggled. I tons of people could tell me how I can solve for getting a certification, but no one could give me an understanding of what the cloud was, let alone what, how I could incorporate that within a job, within a career, how I could be able to speak to that with a client, be able to uh, voice concerns, be able to be ethical in how I execute solutions and gain their trust. That was a big gap in the analysis of understanding what I should do with this. So like I said, I did some research. I started looking on YouTube, man, and ladies. And I saw this guy, real cool, laid back, calm. You know, he's just really nice to deal with. You know, and I'm just like, and he broke it down. And if you all know something, you understand that, A, sometimes the directions read like radio instructions. They're very detailed. They're very bland, but they're very articulate at the same time because it gives you, it. they, they, communicate to you that you already have an understanding of what cloud is and what these facets are and all this material they're with. Man, I don't know what I'm doing. So it's like, okay, let me start talking with, um, getting checking out these videos for Mike. And I started looking at him. I started absorbing all his videos. And one thing that he did that others did not, he demystified what cloud was. He provided the bare bones on what agnostic cloud is and said, don't teach, don't learn AWS, don't learn Google, don't learn OSI, um, Oracle Cloud, 
um, don't learn Google platform, learn the cloud, understand what it is, learn what the basics are. And then you can get a very, once you get the basics and get a foundation, you're able to plug in all that information into whatever cloud platform you choose. And after busting my head and banging my head in AWS for long enough, I had realized that using that formula and going through what Mike had taught me, I had exponentially absorbed all this information. What I stumbled through in three months, he taught me a year's worth in half that time because he he, he broke it down, you know, and I don't know. Uh, it, it, I'm trying to find the words when I had that eureka moment when I'm saying, oh, wow, the pennies are dropping. I'm understanding what this stuff is. So that's how I started to get to the cloud. And I have not looked back since because creating and being involved with this community where I'll be honest and say, and everyone should be able to do the same. I don't know. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. And if I don't know what I don't know, then someone is going to help me and show me how to get over this hurdle. And that's why I love, you know, the, the community. I watch when I first came in, people helped me. They surrounded me. They asked if I needed help. And as I matriculated through the course, through the program, and I got to where I am right now, one thing that I really love about seeing the community is how everyone jumps in. Doesn't matter if you're in South America, doesn't matter if you're uh, a Dane or you're in, in, in anywhere. It doesn't matter from a global perspective. We all came here as a community and watching each other learn on one agnostic plat uh, uh, cloud platform it's just amazing. So I, I could, like you said, Chris has got to reel me in. I can run my mouth. I'm going to reel back in <laughs> and, you know, be mindful of, 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 uh, of, of the surgery that I went through. So, yeah, you know. I was, I was that close. Now I do want to, I want to get back to Mike, but before I get back to Mike, I want to ask you a follow-up Alonzo. Um, what is it? been like for you to be able to give back to the community now like what is that like because that's something uh, i know that that I, I know that's something that you like <laughs> you're not going to go out there and tell everybody hey, i'm giving back <laughs> but but i know that that you get back and i, I i'm going to get back to mike but i want to i want to hear from you what's it like for you to be able to give back what's it like when you see other people giving back and, and what does that do for you? And what does that do for the community when, when that happens? You said you didn't want me to talk a lot. So you get you get you through the reins at me. So <laughs> I'm going to go for it. I'll tell you, it, it's in a reward of, into a, of, of itself. Those who have just recently been cloud hired, you understand where you started. You started from the bottom. Now you're here. And when you receive that first check, you received that first, you were, actually, let's take it back. You received that first nod when he says, you know, you got the call. We'd like to hire, you know, we'd like to offer X, X, and X an opportunity, the feeling that you have. Then you move on, you meet your team. Then you start getting your first couple of checks and you realize where you started, where you are right now. And I'll tell you that feeling to me doesn't compare to me being able to give back. Now, some people remember when I uh, co-taught a boot camp with uh, Mike back in uh, September of 21. And at first I was intimidated. Mike invited me to do it. He's like, come on, you want to do it? You want to do it? I said, I don't know, Mike. And, you know, Mike is very, very influential. He will definitely, he could sell... <laughs> He can he can get you to do anything. He will inspire he, you. He can sell he can sell ice to an Eskimo, as my yes, dad would he say. Could. He <laughs> could do he could sell yeah and 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 you yeah. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. And I taught the thing. I taught it. We went through all the the labs. We started getting we drilling you know we're drilling down into the concepts of networking, compute, storage, databases, all these awesome things. And once the boot camp was over there's a lot of different things that happened with me. One, the imposter syndrome was gone. Two, you sit down and you realize that what you were afraid of, if you just give yourself a chance, believe in yourself, you are going to be able to 
exponentially not only grow, but be able to share those experiences through a teaching platform and be able to strengthen each other as a community. So being able to make that happen was more than money. It was it was more valuable than getting that first check. It was just a blast of 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 just man, just love, appreciation, gratefulness that you have come across such a wonderful community that took me in and now I'm able to give back so that you all can learn and you all can help someone else. As we continue to grow as a community, as we continue to expand as a community, there is nothing that can hold us back if we continue to grow, exchange information, and be able to bring in those who are curious about the cloud. Stay hungry about it. Bring them in, man. And ladies, and just share what we know because a lot of the, the stereo and, you know, uh, 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 themed instructions of AWS and all the other documentation that you will grow to uh, love, hate in white papers, you'll be able to easily extrapolate it and share that content so that those who don't know, they'll be able to understand. And you, you're that platform for them. You are the ambassador for cloud. So get on out there, learn, share what in the community, what you've learned resources, how you found something like, like last week, I found a really awesome gem on a website that provided architecture frameworks, um, cloud agnostic um, concepts. Some of you may have caught on to it in my LinkedIn posts. Get that type of resource, share it with the community, talk about it within your groups. How can you grow? How can you apply it in your new jobs, or if you're looking for a job, how can you use that as an example to illustrate your know-how in the um, in your interviews? So there's so much that we can share, so much that we can learn and grow. Just step out there. Don't be afraid and just learn and grow. I'm going to drop the mic because I can keep going. I love this stuff. <laughs> well, in case you didn't realize, I'm slowly turning this into your interview video, like I've been doing all the other interview videos. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I'll, 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 I'll gonna, your comments. Yeah, I was going to bring it back to Mike. I saw Mike doing a little wipe into the eye there. You know, they, I, I, I think there were a couple of tears. There may have been so, actually there, especially man, all what Alonzo said, and then the culmination of what Ru Ruth said that you popped up on the screen. That kind of got me. Yeah. But, so get, I'll let you close it out on talking about the community because it's you know, it's something that it wasn't. A while back. It's yeah, something completely you know, there's different. A, there's a couple of reasons for that. And I want to thank a lot of people for that. So what my goal was when I went into tech, we all just collaborated. And, and, and you know, I, when I went into tech, I worked for lots of good companies. And then I went to Cisco. And then when John Chambers ran Cisco, and when, he, when I met him, I was there like three days. And he, John Chambers comes in. And he says something. And he, sa he says, look, this is the global accounts team that's on the bleeding edge. A lot of people want to tell me what's going on. Don't report the news, make the news. And when I heard that for the first time, I was thinking, wait a second, he's telling all of us to innovate. Go innovate and start your own business. And I went, wow. And I built a career on that and loved that. And we all as a community at Cisco did that. We worked so hard to build each other up. And, and I love that. And that's what I tried to do by building this community. But I got to tell you, I was going to try and do it on LinkedIn. Because, you know, I'm an architect. I know, you know, the business side. How do we improve a business's performance through tech? The network, the servers, what it needs to look like, the security. That's what I know. But I'm not Mr. I want to use software. In fact, if it's up to me, I would use text messaging. I would use phone, email, and I wouldn't have a single other application because then I wouldn't have to call Chris and ask him how to use it like every day and Chris says hey Mike we need this slack thing and I'm like oh god no that's as ugly as can be and he says but you don't understand everybody's going to work together I'm like oh and I still didn't see it and next thing I realize I've got a Bulgarian student who's speaking with his army veteran of mine and then and they're there and then this next person is communicating with this next person and now I've got people meeting together all over the world last week we, got, we had three meetups Chris right I saw some of the photos of people getting together and it, it just, it, it warmed my heart. I was thrilled about it. So yeah, I love that concept of, you know, building a community. I want to bring back that old tech thing with one new twist. In the old days, it was all about the tech. And about five years into tech, I learned 
guess what? The tech is not the secret to your, the technology professional's career. And that sounds crazy. It's not about the tech. It's what we can do with the tech for the business. That's what I learned, and that's what changed my career. Yeah, I wish that I, uh, I wish that I had been prepared to uh, come up with some pictures. But I'll just, I'm going to show some pictures later of the of the uh, of the meetups from this weekend. Um, but yeah, you you brought up a good point, Mike. That uh, yeah, I don't I don't think we would have had the meetups happening if we were on LinkedIn. <laughs> but, that's, that's all you. Yeah. Know. Yeah. So that that was a that 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 has been a really exciting. Uh, turn of events over the past few months but so we'll move on from the um from the talk about about the community because i know that we could talk about the uh community forever uh because the community is is just amazing um but um so the big topic that we wanted to talk about today of course is the uh is the private cloud hybrid cloud multi-cloud and, and how to implement those type that type of uh, infrastructure, so to speak. Um, and we, we mentioned it briefly last week about OpenStack and Nutanix. I don't even know where to begin with these. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to let Mike start off with uh, talking about OpenStack and Nutanix, um, what they are, uh, how organizations have used them in the past, uh, how they might use them now, whatever they are. Again, I don't know these. I'm not a tech guy, as I tell everybody every day. So, uh, Mike, if you will enlighten us and me about OpenStack and Nutanix. Am I supposed to be the tech guy? You're right. super, well, it doesn't have to be techy. It's it's got, you got to... I no, mean, sure. I, I, I got to know, know a little something. So let's educate, <laughs> let's educate Chris on what OpenStack and Nutanix are. Sounds good. And I, I, and I like these technologies so much. I actually was almost ready to take a customer success director with Nutanix a couple of years ago. And then COVID happened. And, but uh, that's how much I actually like this. But let's, before we talk about Nutanix or OpenStack, let's define the cloud. And let's talk about what a cloud is. Yeah, a cloud is a data center and a network that's been virtualized. So what goes in a data center? You got this big building, you got two power supplies supplies coming in. Why do you have two power supplies coming in? Because if you have a power failure, your data center will go out and businesses can't afford for their systems to go down. So all data centers have two sets of power coming in. Now, in case both power companies were, get a, were to get attacked by, by attackers and they were to shut them down, you can't, the data center can't lose power. So the organization will typically have multiple generators and usually backup generators to make sure that if power fails, the generator kicks in. And then we have Multiple cooling systems. Why do we have cooling systems? Because this data center is a huge building and it's going to be filled with stuff that's going to get real hot. So we're going to have multiple air conditioning systems that are going to produce more cooling than you've ever dreamed in your life. And we're going to go into these buildings with winter coats because it's going to be cold as can be in there. And then inside of these big giant buildings, we have our network, our routers and switches. We have our servers, thousands of them. We have our storage area networks like our block storage and object storage that we have. We have file servers sitting in these environments or NAS systems. We have physical load balancers, the kind that F5 makes. We have firewalls, the kind Cisco and Checkpoint and Palo Alto make. We have intrusion detection or intrusion prevention systems. And that's what our, is sitting in our data center. Now, we're typically using VMware ESXi. When I create a virtual machine, I create it in VMware. All good, right? But now, What's good about the data center and what's bad about it? Well, if I want to install a new server, I go to VMware, I create a virtual machine, and I install the operating system, which is perfect until I run out of server capacity. When I run out of server capacity, what do I need to do? I need to call Dell or IBM, and I need to order a server. And I've got to wait for them to send that server to me, and they ship it to me, and I, I, have, I pay somebody to rack it, stack it, we install the operating system, and we're good. So... Uh, that's what a data center is. Now, what if we wanted the agility of the cloud, the ability to spin up a virtual machine and have it go on any server in our data center at a moment's notice? That if we wanted to spin up a three-tier app, like a web tier, 
we could just do it on our capacity, the same way we did it in the cloud in a couple of mouse clicks, create virtual load balancers on demand, and not have to you know, go to the data center and start screwing and unscrewing things in. Effectively, wow, we get all the benefits of the AWS cloud or the Azure cloud or the Google cloud in our own data center. The coolness, the agility, the speed, the performance. But wait, we get more. And why? Well, let's say you've got a thousand mile wire between you and AWS. The speed of light is fast, but guess what? It takes a couple of milliseconds to get from your data center to AWS. So in your data center, you have less latency. So if you've got a mission critical application that can't tolerate latency, the best thing you can do is your data center. What's the compromise? Edge computing. What is edge computing? It's a data center between your office, your data center, and the cloud. It's another data center midway through, but it's still more latency than your own data center. What else in our data center? Let's talk about performance. So let's talk about cloud disk performance. And I hate to say it, regardless of what you read in the certification course, it's horrible. And here's what I mean. Block storage performance is pathetically slow. Now, it's the fastest option we have in the cloud, but it is horrible. You want to know how slow it is? Every one of you, go Google. Go to the Amazon store and buy it. Look up a Samsung 980 Pro as an NVMe drive. Look at how many IOPS you get. No, you'll get about 7,000 megabit per second throughput. And you'll also get about a million IOPS for about 100 bucks. Now, let's think, can you get a million IOPS in the cloud? Well, in AWS, provision IOPS volume, you know, real fast gives you 64,000. So that's about a 15th the speed that you actually get from a $100 drive at Best Buy. So now think about your data center. I need rapid disk performance. Well, you can use this, the hard drives that are sitting inside the disk in your data center. Think about the latency to get to the cloud. There is none. Think about extremely low sensitivity applications that you can bundle close to each other. Better performance in the data center. So there's lots of reasons we want to go to the cloud, scalability, agility, et cetera. But with OpenStack, we can create that same cloud in our same data center. By creating the same cloud in the same data center, we now have cloud agility. Now with either OpenStack or Nutanix, and all they really are is software packages. And here's what happens. You take your servers, you install basically the Linux operating system, or at least the Linux kernel, and you install the control plane. What is the control plane? The control plane is the orchestration that says uh, Chris's VM goes on this server, Alonzo's VM goes on this server, Jawad's VM goes on this server, Eva's, Eva's VM goes on this server, Chow's VM goes on this server, Badar's VM goes on this server. It's the control plane that's managing it. So that's what this is. It's the control plane. And then your servers, the forwarding plane, or the data plane. So now you know what they are. They are just the ability for you to do it. How many people use these? Well, a lot. American Express, OpenStack. American Airlines, OpenStack. Verizon, OpenStack. So these private clouds are everywhere. So because of so performance, let's talk about the cost of running the workloads. Which do you think guys think are cheaper? Running a computer that somebody else is, or running something that you've already previously paid for. Running something you've already previously paid for. So we're going to the cloud for the agility. But what if an organization has thousands of servers? They can, they can get rid of the old slow stuff. They can take all the new modern stuff and create their own cloud. So now they can use their current servers that they've already paid for. Remember on the cloud, you're renting somebody else's server, which means they must charge you more for the use of the server than it costs them. So here you've got zero cost. Here you've got something that basically costs three to five times per hour what it costs to run in the data center on the cloud. It's not even a comparison. So why, why, why are we doing it on the cloud? It's the agility purposes. We love the agility, so the agility is there. But we can have the agility here now, with OpenStack and Nutanix, when you can configure the cloud with a CLI, that can automatically go and configure your other clouds as well. It can partition things on Google or AWS or things like that. So you're really getting a lot. 
Let's talk about availability. Let's think of a hospital. If you are connected to a public cloud and the cloud were to go down, your patients are going to die. So you should never, ever be on one cloud because if a single cloud has, has a control plane failure, like we just talked about for this test, if it has a network failure or gets hacked, guess what? There is no cloud. So with a medical facility, a bank, by necessity, you must use a minimum of at least two clouds. But here's the problem. I've got a wire that goes to Google. I've got a wire that goes to AWS. There's problems in the underground wiring right now for some reason. We're still down. Something hits your big internet service providers. But guess what? If it's in your data center, there's no networking there between it. So no matter what, you'll always be available in the data center. So these are reasons why organizations love OpenStack and Nutanix. Back to you, Chris. Well, my my head is just kind of like bulging, trying to absorb all that information. But I know the people in the chat box have definitely definitely enjoyed that. Um, if uh, Alonzo, if, I'm not sure if there's anything that you want to add to the uh, add to the conversation. If if there is, feel free to. Um, I'm still trying to figure out which direction to go with the conversation. Again, I, I'm new to the topic, and it, it's just I could I could probably ask a million questions, and they might not be the right questions. But uh, try. But yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I think we need to because I I know I've established rapport with Mike on the conversations, but I think I would like to know what I think we need to flip the the conversation to you. I want to know what your thoughts are with it. I really want to know. I, I think it would be a great, it, it's refreshing because when you think about someone who hasn't spent that type of perspective in the cloud and you want to know more, it's some, sometimes it's some of those most simplistic questions yet engaging that create the topic of discussion. So I just want one question from you, Mike. I mean, you know, uh, Chris, I really want to know. I just like, I don't want to flip it, but I'm like, I know how I'll respond and I'll be talking for hours. So I want to see. All right. All right. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> I was not prepared to become an active part of this discussion, but uh, adapt to provide. All right. Perfect. Um, so I guess my, I guess if I had a question, it would be, and, and I'm, I feel like Mike has answered it to to an extent in, in what he's already said, uh, but I also I also have a benefit of like osmosis because I'm in every single like call that he has or <laughs> class that he has or YouTube Q and A that he does. So it's like there's bits and pieces of stuff kind of floating around in there that they're not really connected to anything. So as soon as I ask it, I'm going to be like, oh wait, I already know the answer to that. Um, so I guess my my question being. I, I, I guess I could be the voice of the people that are new to the cloud because I, even though I'm with Go Cloud Careers, I'm the operations guy. I'm the business guy. I'm not the, I'm not the cloud guy. I'm not the tech guy. I'm not the networking guy. Um, so, when it comes to OpenStack and Nutanix, if, if me being fresh to this topic. I'm familiar with AWS. I'm familiar with Google Cloud. I'm familiar with Azure because they're they're everywhere. They're all over the place. Uh, they're, they're names everywhere. There's videos about them everywhere. There's blog articles about them everywhere. There's training courses about them everywhere. What, why would I need to know anything about OpenStack or Nutanix? And that's a good question. So if the whole world was all going to the public cloud providers, in a moment's notice, you wouldn't. But there's a couple of things that are going on. From an availability perspective, nothing is better than a hybrid cloud. From a performance and a latency perspective, nothing is better than a hybrid cloud. So for those mission critical organizations, a big bank, a hospital, where, billion, where millions or billions can be lost per second or people can die, you're really looking for a more robust solution other than just two clouds. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons you should care. But also, 
Look, I put together billion dollar architectures in my past life. And, and working at Cisco and things like that, you know, with IBM where they'd be end to end and they'd be huge. You know, the, a lot of the technology is still good. And a lot of the technology is not going away. So, for example, back in 1996, there was this technology called Data Link Switching Plus. And what we were doing was we were tunneling mainframe traffic through the internet that wasn't routable. And I remember, because it was on my CCI exam, people were like, why are you doing that? There's not a lot of mainframes. And I said, yes, there are. They're all over the place. If I tell you that I still see mainframes out there 25 years ago, there's that. I, I've worked in companies where they have a mission critical app that was sitting on somebody's computer on a virtual machine and the person died and nobody knows how it works and half of their business is running through this application and they're trying to figure out how to replace it. So, you know, because the legacy is there, I say it matters. But also, more importantly, if you're a cloud architect, you need to know the cloud. Hmm. And if yeah, you're so that... a virtual machine, it, you need to know if it's in Nutanix, if it's an OpenStack, if it's an EC2 instance in AWS, if it's a compute instance on uh, Google, if it's an Azure virtual machine, it doesn't matter. So you should just, know, as a cloud architect, if you really know the tech, you know all the clouds. So, so I guess the more appropriate way, uh, I won't say appropriate way, the more mature now that I've asked the question, the, the next step of that question is, okay, it's not that I need to know OpenStack or Nutanix. It's what I hear you say every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know the cloud. There's no the cloud. <laughs> There's no the cloud. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's easy enough for me. Um, so uh, Alonzo, was that appropriate enough or should I, 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 I got more. I got more questions. So. <laughs> You know what? I, I thought this, and, and, and I'm sorry if you felt like I, I put you out. Oh, there. no, no. I, I, I put you guys on the spot every day. So, <laughs> But I, I thought it would, it would provide a unique perspective because we talk almost every day, but you are the operations guy. It's like, but you still have that exposure. It's kind of like you have no choice but to take in osmosis, you know, through this and understand these concepts. So yeah. I think it was so applicable to what your perspective is and how relatable it is to everyone who is just now starting with um, Go Cloud Careers and those who you know, have been here for a while and they're still trying to get the lay of the land. I think there was yeah. a lot of parallels there. And oh, it's so, fu it's so funny we're talking about this and I'm sitting here trying to think, what the heck is a virtual machine in AWS? Oh, it doesn't matter. I know what a virtual machine is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I like, I, I just had that thought and it's just funny because I'm, again, I'm not actively trying to learn this. This is just things that have just kind of seeped into my, yeah. seeped into my brain. Um, but it benefits me that I know what a virtual machine is. Mm -hmm. But not only does it benefit you here, I'm an yeah. architect. I'm going to go march into an executive's office, my customer. If I say, we're going to take your virtual machines to the cloud. They're going to say, thank you, Mike. If I say, hey, I got this elastic compute cloud thing and this Amazon civil right. storage thing, they're going to laugh at me and say, hey, Mike, are you, do you have stock in Amazon? So as an architect, I can't use proprietary names. I lose all my credibility. I've got to appear vendor neutral. I've got to be a customer evangelist, not a uh, cloud evangelist. So yeah. I can't use it. So I need to know it's a virtual machine and not, a, not use obfuscation and, you know, hide it among something and you know somebody asked a question in there and said hey isn't one cloud better for hybrid cloud no here's the thing it's all marketing 128 core server in azure is 128 core server in aws they're made by the same people same cpus it really doesn't matter who you buy and which amd cpus you're buying right epic cpus they're all the same and the storage yeah. for the most part is all made by the same people and the networking stuff is all made by the same people so what's different what they choose to call it and what it looks like and feels like to you, but it's all the same. Yeah. And, I mean, Alonzo, you've opened up a can of worms here now, so I'm going to get another question. Um, so the, uh, and, and it's a question that I had, but I also see a couple of them in the chat box that, that are related to the same question. Um, it is, uh, I, I can't find them right now, but um, is there a preference or is there a one better than the other type of situation when it comes to OpenStack, Nutanix, or some other, uh, I saw one in the chat box, um, uh, hyper-converged, Cisco hyper-converged 
HX side. So this is where we're starting to get crazy with the names. But is there a preference or is one better than the other when it comes to these like private oh. cloud things? They're all Thanks. kind of the same. <laughs> now, here's what I would say. OpenStack is incredible. And for the most part, if you buy OpenStack, you're going to buy it from Red Hat and they maintain it. And they're awesome. Of course, you could also do it in freeware. There's the freeware version of it as well. I will say that Nutanix is very elegant in that to use OpenStack, you've got to be really, really smart. You've got to have really strong Linux engineering skills to set that up. And Nutanix is much more user friendly. So I wouldn't say one's better than the other, but the staff, the cost of the staff to support a Nutanix cloud is going to be a lot cheaper than the staff to support an OpenStack cloud. And uh, I'm not 100% gotcha. familiar with the Cisco so cloud solution. Um, I, I will say that Cisco is the best company I've ever worked for in my entire life. I will tell you that when I was in the Internet Business Solutions Group, we were investigating how we could advise the cloud providers and what we could do with cloud competing because we were on the bleeding trends of that. But, uh, but I will also say that uh, when I retired from Cisco, um, you know, I, I don't know exactly all the new things they're doing. And most of the people I worked with, that generation of people all left to Cisco and they either went to Google, AWS, Datanix, OpenStack, or VMware. I'm gonna hijack that comment. Why were they able to get cloud jobs? The reason every one of these people went to cloud providers and needed no <laughs> certifications whatsoever <laughs> is the cloud is a virtual network and a data center, and that's what we've all done for the last 30 years. So the reason people have a hard time getting cloud jobs isn't like because they're not certified. It's that here's what we do with cloud architects. We take the stuff from the network and data center and move it to the cloud, and everybody's learning the cloud, but they're not learning the network and the data center, so they have no idea how to bring it to the cloud because cloud certification doesn't cover that. You would think they'd talk about how do you do that, but no, they just talk about how do you configure a service, which is really hilarious because architects don't configure anything anyway. All right. Well, before we move on, is there anything else that either one of you would like to add into the conversation about uh, private clouds, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud? How about you, Alonzo, and then I'll go. I'm thinking... Um... There's a lot of resources. The more I start digging and researching, you, you tend to you're, you're familiar with the big three. Um, and then you have the other um, other tier uh, clouds. And then I, I happen to come across uh, what is it? Uh, Hewlett Packard or was it? I think they had something called a um, I think they're doing some cloud based things as well. So there's a lot of different competition out there um, on different spheres of, 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 of comp I, I guess, different spheres of competition that, and I cannot remember for the life of me what organization that was, but the more you start to research and get out of those normal confines of what you come into the cloud understanding, you, you want to kind of get an understanding of what a lot of those obscure names and of, of those other companies are and how they are relatable to the cloud industry, what kind of platforms they use, um, how do they service an enterprise um, and what are the, the tiers that they use to to execute the cloud within that space? And it, it's really fun to kind of pioneer or, or self pioneer um, searches to see what you have applied, what you know and how you can apply it within that that specific environment. So it I tend to try to push myself to not focus on just the usual flavors that you see every month. Imagine how you would be if you were in uh, you had a new opportunity for for a job, no job opportunity. And they're uh, a lower tier organization. They don't have the funding. How would they resource their cloud expectations with other t other tier, you know, other cloud providers? How would they sync that up? What would the architecture be? Would it be slightly different because they don't have it? They don't have the funds to power up these specific architectures that a lot of these large corporations could do. And you want to kind of keep your your mind elastic, you know, no pun intended to AWS anything, but being able to expand your mind on all these other clouds out here like Nutanix, OpenStack, and see how they apply their, their architecture and their solutions to other companies. Yeah, and, you know, 
I'm running an OpenStack cloud here right now. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's about 99% cheaper for me to run it. But, right. you know, every use case is different. Why is it so cheap for me to run my OpenStack cloud? Well, I don't need to hire a networking professional because I've got a little background there. I don't need to buy any networking gear because Cisco generally sends it to me and says, here, test this, Mike. I don't need firewalls and security. So for that, all I'm dealing with is servers. Now, if I was dealing with the need to build the cloud and the network and all that, it'd be a totally different situation. So we always got to evaluate it. But here's one thing. I don't have a single student in the cloud architect or development program that doesn't build their own cloud. Why do I make every single student in our training program build the cloud? Well, you should just know what a cloud is and how you're going to know until you truly build it and see it. But more importantly than that, every cloud architect should know what it is. And, and also, I mean, you can tell an employer, look, I've built the cloud. And the competition is saying, hey, I turned on a virtual machine, and they don't even know it's a virtual machine. Because they say, hey, I set up an Elastic Compute Cloud instance, and you ask them what it is, they say, I don't know. You build yourself that cloud, it's going to make you guys stand out amongst the competition when it comes to getting cloud hired. It'll help you dramatically. Back to you, Chris. All right, so I did. Um, I did find something that I put together the other day. Uh, I've lost it since then, um, so we'll come back to it. Uh, I was going to share a picture of the meetup, but you know, we 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 fly here uh, sometimes. You got some lighting um, challenges there, Alonzo. Do what? <laughs> Alonzo's lights went off or something. Oh boy, oh. Yeah, it's it's getting a little little windy out here. <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's uh while, while I look for the picture that I found, we'll uh we'll move on to the next topic, and it's a it's another one that came from a previous uh, previous session mm -hmm. that uh, where where we were asked about how we've handled uh, difficult situations or. or are delicate situations with clients or customers, um, and, and, and any any insights that we might be able to provide for the for for those types of situations. Because there's going to be times where you, either you can't deliver, or you can't deliver what was originally uh, agreed to, or you know you run into obstacles. There's always going to be difficulties or delicate situations that need to be dealt with. Um, yeah. I don't remember who brought that up last time, but it was uh, something that we said we would definitely get back to on a, on a future session. So I wanted to take the chance to get back to that. And that, and it's and, actually the perfect uh, question. Yeah. Uh, so we'll start with you, Mike, because this is definitely, this is a non-technical part of a lot of tech jobs. Yes. Um, and I'll tell you what. It was every tech job. Has this, this is more than 50% of the cloud architect's job. I mean, at least 50% and before, and then I'll get to this. So when I call most of my cloud architect buddies and say, hey, what are you doing? I tell jokes, I buy dinners, I buy drinks. Have you ever touched tech? No, Mike, I'm an architect. Have you ever configured anything? Of course not, Mike, I'm an architect. How much did you spend last year buying dinners? A little over $150,000. Okay, that's about what I spent. How, many, how much did you spend on scotch? About $30,000. How much did you spend on wine? So, you know, people have it in their mind that we architects are, you know, doing this, but we're really smoothing over ruffled feathers. So why do we find ourselves with ruffled feathers? Because somewhere, someone along the line did one of the following. Sold something that wouldn't work, either because they didn't know or because they were just overzealous and that sales engineer didn't catch them. Or the product should work, but it doesn't or the customer didn't follow your directions and they're angry at you that it didn't work. All of these things occur. So what, what do you deal with this? Well, it all comes down to the following. First thing you gotta do is find out what happened. And that means going there or calling the person and really opening up an establishing report. Alonzo, can you tell me what happened? What's going on? How are you today? Oh, you can't hear me. Okay. So whatever the case may be is you've got to open it up and ask some questions. Now, the reason I say soft skills and emotional intelligence and communication skills are more important than your technical skills as a cloud architect, because half of your job is this. It's showing up on site. It's, you know, 
being emotionally intelligent and looking someone in the eye and say, how can I help you? If your company did something wrong, it's taking ownership of it immediately. Hey, Chris, I know our company promised this. They weren't able to deliver for this, this, and this, but here's what I'm going to do to try and make it up to you. What else can I do to make it right with you? Chris, how is this affecting you? What else can I do to solve your problem in the short term? Because if Chris comes and his system's down, it doesn't work. But a server and it's not working. If I say to Chris, look, I'm so sorry we promised you these 100 servers and only 80 are working. I know that's got a massive impact on your business. If I get you 40 more right now, will that work until we can figure out what's going on? And in the meantime, I'll stay here. I'll work with your team and I'll bring in my team of people to help resolve it quicker. He's not going to be as angry as me. He may still be unhappy with the company, but he's not angry with me. Now I go in there, I get Chris's problem resolved. I commit to everything I promised. We sit down, we have dinner, we have a couple of drinks. We go meet up again in another month. I check in on them. How are you? Is everything working? Do you need anything from me? Now Chris likes me more than before the outage even occurred. Now Chris is actually an ally to me. So what does it really come down to? First, you've got to find the person's problem. Chris, describe a problem to me real quick. I don't care what it is. I can't connect to the internet on my phone. It's just not connecting. I can't get Get the network. Okay, Chris, if I heard you correctly, you're telling me that you can't connect to the internet on your phone. It's just not getting onto the network. Is that true? Is that exactly what was going on? Yes. Okay. Now I've confirmed the problem, which makes him feel that I've heard him. But not only does it make him feel that I've heard him, I confirmed that I didn't make a mistake. So, Chris, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my team to you, and we're going to start investigating what's going on with your phone not being able to reach the internet. How does that sound? But I had to confirm it. But I had to confirm yeah. it with him first. If I said, yes, "Chris, I'm on it," would you have been totally comfortable? No. So a lot of this is emotional intelligence, but it's also ownership. If you make a mistake, you own it. And what's going to happen is a lot of times the company is going to sell something, and it's just not going to work. So the next thing you've got to do is you've got to be empathetic. You've got to see it from the customer's perspective. How would you feel if you were them? And address it that way. Look, I worked at a company before I worked at Cisco. They sold video over DSL. And let me tell you, there were about two of us at the company that knew how to make it work and five of us in the world that knew how to make it work. And it never worked right. So everywhere I went, Mike, can you go to Iowa? They bought this thing. Mike, can you go to Dubai? They bought $40 million of routers and it's not working. Mike, can you go here? So I did it, a lot of it. And as soon as you go there, I'd say, I'm sorry. Show me. How is this affecting you? How is this affecting you with your job? Because guess what? Somebody else might be getting close to getting fired because of a mistake our company made. You have to address that. If I'm at Cisco and I just sold a $200 million technology architecture to a bank and that's not working, yeah, I'm going to be speaking to that bank, but I might ask the CEO of the bank to go call the CEO of that company and say, look, I'm working with your team. You've got a rock star team. I'm going to send in 30 people right now, but letting you know your team's rock solid. I'm here. Here's my phone number. Here's my cell phone. You can talk to me to the end. Did I keep that person, the CIO from getting fired? Yeah. So I, gotta, I have to address their concerns. And because even when you have an argument or a negotiation, you can win and you can demolish your opponent. Don't demolish your opponent. Let them save face. Everybody's got a negotiation. Everybody got to do something. You give this person that made a mistake a chance to fix it with their manager. Let's say the customer made a mistake. And they blamed you. You have two options. The first you can do is go to the company's manager and say, hey, your employee's a bozo. Now, if they don't fire that employee, guess what? You now have a nightmare on your hands. Or when the, you can go to the person's manager and when they ask what happened, just say, 
Look. There was an issue with the configuration. Not sure how it occurred. But together we collaborated and it's not resolved and it won't ever happen again. You didn't make that person look like an idiot. You built an ally. So it's all about your emotional intelligence. So, you know, Chris, let's go back to you. Because how would you deal with a problem client? How would you deal with a stressful situation? Even in the hotel industry, it's all the same thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that's true. Um, all right. So uh, obviously, as everybody can see, Alonso has uh, left the building. He, he has sent us a message. He's dealing with a brownout right now thanks to the, uh, thanks to the winds in, that he's dealing with. Um, so impromptu adapt and improvise from Chris. <laughs> um, so uh, my, like Mike said, it's about emotional intelligence uh, when you're dealing with any uh, difficult situation or, or delicate situations. Um, every industry, every job, every position has problems. You, you, you will always encounter a situation where you are not able to produce what was agreed to, or you're not able to, to satisfy uh, a customer's needs. Um, you know, my background is in the hotel industry and in the hotel industry, every single day, people aren't, people sat, <laughs> people are satisfied. So uh, it's something that, that we deal with. Um, you know, I've had, I've had an example in the hotel industry where we had a, had a college football team who had booked out a hotel. Uh, and then that same hotel decided that they were going to book a movie crew for the same rooms at the same time. Oh God. So, so a decision had to be made movie crew football team, both had the same rooms. It's only a 70 room hotel. You can't fit everybody. Um, and, and in this particular situation, the movie crew got to stay because the movie crew was there for, for weeks and weeks and the football team was there for, for, for two nights. But somebody had to notify the football team. Somebody had to explain to the university why we couldn't live up to the contract. Somebody had to offer a solution. And by somebody, I mean me. <laughs> oh. But you have to you have to approach it with empathy, and uh, in this particular situation, there was nothing that could be done except find a solution and present the solution and make the solution work. Uh, in this particular situation, it was such short notice that there was no alternative in town. We had to move them forty five miles away, <laughs> and we had to fall on our sword. We had to provide meals, transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Give them my cell phone number. Uh, give them my coworker's cell phone number. You know, reach out to local organizations, the Chamber of Commerce and the, the, the university that they were competing against, saying, hey, uh, we need to come together. Help us, help us resolve the situation. Luckily, we've got good relationships with these people. Um, the development of emotional intelligence to build relationships with these other organizations that you can then reach out to and say, Hey, I got a problem. Let's work together to make this happen. Um, at the end of the day, it wasn't the prettiest solution, but the empathy and the emotional intelligence to be able to, to deal with that stressful situation is what makes the difference. Um, that was a situation where they could have just completely dropped us and left us high and dry and gone with another company. But because of how we handled the situation, they stuck with us. May not have worked out that time, but because of how we handled the situation, we continued to get their business for other sports for the remainder of the season. And in a lot of situations, that would have lost all of their all of the rest of their business. So I went on a long, I went on a, <laughs> down, went down a spiral about hotel industry difficulties, but I did that to show it's the same in any industry. It's the same in any job. It's, it's how, you, how you handle the situation. And if you don't have the emotional intelligence to be able to, to handle it properly, it, it can be detrimental. 
Uh, so I don't know if that's if I added much to the conversation there, Mike, but I did. I feel like I added some some flavor. <laughs> you added a lot, and I'll tell you where I learned these skills. It wasn't an MBA program. It wasn't in leadership training. You know, when when you practice medicine, sometimes you have to tell someone that you did everything they could, and you couldn't bring the family member back. Sometimes you have to tell someone they have cancer. And sometimes you have to deal with the spouse. So in medicine, we get special emotional intelligence training. And it's really about how do you communicate with the person and how do you manage your emotions and how do you breathe the way they breathe to calm them down? And how do you manage your emotions and you add some psychology along the way? Do you, have, do you add some thinking corrections along the way? There's just so much that goes into it. But yeah. It's the same thing in every career. It really, really matters. Our emotional intelligence. The hotel industry, yeah. Guess what? Sales is all about emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. architecture and sales reps literally spend 50 to 60% of their time rebuilding relationships. Marketing as well, too, Mike. Yeah. Marketing, too, yes. Yeah. Um, but air here makes a good point. You know, help desk, they, is, they're just like frontline people in the hotel industry. <laughs> they, they, they develop that emotional intelligence or either they don't, they, they, they don't make it, you know? Um, so that's the, is it, that's something that we talk about now that you talk about, Mike, is the, uh, about the, no such yeah. thing as no experience. In fact, we you know, really tend to have really good customer, customer service skills is customer service rep. I love bringing them into technology and here's why. <laughs> if all you do all day is get, is get used to taking people that are angry and make them smile, you know how great of an architect you are when that's 50, 60% of your job and mm -hmm. that's all you've done? So, you know, I do remember taking a customer service rep. And when they were going to go on an architect interview, they're like, what do I say? I say, tell them you've been dealing with customer complaints for 10 years, taking people that are unhappy with something and making them satisfied and designing a solution to solve their problem. Not only did that person get an incredible job with no cloud experience whatsoever, but the employer was like, I need that on my team. So yep. it's a matter of just showing that your old experience matters to the employer. Yeah. It, Paul it has a, a, oh, sorry, Alonzo, I'll let you talk. No, no, I, I, I was just thinking it, it, it brought me back to the marketing days where um, I had to pitch. Uh, our job was to create a solution just like a cloud architect would to provide um, an answer to a problem that a customer had. They had a product. They weren't getting a lot of coverage. They weren't getting a lot of exposure. Um, and it was our task to provide that with some sort of nifty uh, situation where they were able to pitch and sell their product to the market. And you think about all the times. I'm, I'm sorry, I have um, some issues with some other things. Sorry for the uh, problem with the noise. Um, but when you think about when you think about how you have to pitch to your client, whether it's cloud or anything else, your job is to provide that solution, present it in a way that is favorable to their to your client and be able to answer any questions or add that value um, that they wouldn't see before. So I just wanted to chime in and say I see the parallels of what where Mike came from, where you came from, and how we can utilize those strengths moving forward into the cloud. It's all universal. Like you said, Mike, no one walks in here with zero experience. And some no of that one. stuff is what leverages you into that next sphere of, of success in the cloud. And the reason, yeah. for the most part, the architects are so focused on doing this 60 plus percent of their time is sadly in tech, most people are not very emotionally intelligent. So what happens is we've got some engineers and a, a lot of engineers are smart people. And this doesn't do this, but a lot of engineers have egos. Look how smart I am. Look how smart I am. Look how smart I am. Look at my 62 certifications. No, look at my 40 certifications. And sometimes the engineers ruffle a lot of feathers trying to show each other who's smarter. You've got a sales engineer that's trying to sell something and you've got the customer engineer that's trying to make the sales engineer look like an idiot so they can look smart to their managers. And then you've got the sales engineer trying to make this engineer look stupid to his manager. And then the end, you, the architect, go in there and buy dinners and drinks to try and smooth that over. So uh, all critical in every career, but especially critical here. And in tech, if you're emotionally intelligent, it gives you more options than anybody else out there because it makes you a diamond, a unicorn. Yeah, so Pawan has a, uh, has a good question here. Um, so empathy is one aspect of emotional intelligence. What are some other aspects 
that make us emotionally intelligent? So emotional intelligence is the ability to control your emotions as well as somebody else's. So first you have to be able to manage your emotions. And that's why Pawan, we, I have some pranayama breathing in our course. That's also why I taught yoga in the course. I had a really great yoga instructor come and do that. That's also the reason I taught some cognitive behavior therapy in the course too. So you can manage your own emotions. So Pawan, when you get to that section of the course, you'll, you'll see that it's there. But it's also, oh, my, my baby girl's here. Um, let me see if I can borrow her. Can I borrow you for a minute, baby girl? So we can show you the world. Look at, look at this beautiful, beautiful little girl. Okay. Know, we don't <laughs> but um, every once in a while, you get this beautiful little, little, little girl comes to my office, and she makes me really happy. She used to sit on my lap all day, but that's neither her nor there. But uh, the ability to control somebody else's emotions. So... That's the key, Pohan. How do you relax somebody else? How do you get somebody to open up, to give you the information so you can show them that you understand them and hear them and try and find a means to solve them down? So that's all the components that go to emotional intelligence, controlling your emotions and managing others. And that will be with tone of voice, reading social cues, reading body language, and really listening, listening, listening. So I like to tell people, listen more than you speak. For a guy that talks as much as I do, I listen a lot more. So that's, you know, really the point. Two ears, one mouth for a reason, as my friend Andrea likes to say. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that's an, enough discussion about that. I think it's time to, uh, you know, get to some of the questions that I've seen coming in. Yeah. on the uh, on the chat box. But what I want to point out is that, you know, we're, I have agreed to take any questions that you may have for me. If you've ever wanted to ask me a question, <laughs> you can ask me a question. Alonzo was voluntold that he <laughs> will, <laughs> will do the same thing. <laughs> And, uh, and and Mike is always here to take the questions. Yeah, I just take questions. Uh, I'm just going. But but in, in all seriousness, if there's ever if there's a question that you've ever wanted to ask me or Alonzo that you've not had that had the chance to ask, please feel free to ask. Fire away. But, but in the meantime, I found my picture, so I'm going to share my picture here. So this weekend we had our I guess you could call it the first round of. Uh, of meetups of the go cloud community so let me share some pictures from the, so the uh, ones that we helped organize we saw some pretty cool ones before we decided oh yeah 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 so here's uh here's the um the uh the ones from this weekend so uh, up here on the top left uh it's a, it's a bowling meetup that happened in chelsea in new york city um Bottom left here, we had some, uh, I think they called it Coffee and Cloud in uh, Sandy Springs there in Atlanta, Georgia. And then on the right here, we had um, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area uh, had a meetup uh, there at, I think they met up at a Cheddar's uh, Scratch Kitchen there in Irving or Frisco or Allen or one of the one of those places around Dallas, <laughs> but I, I couldn't keep up with it. They were, but they 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 had a fun time this weekend, and I know next weekend or this coming weekend, there is a meetup at the Bowling at a Bowling Alley in Georgetown, uh, in Washington D.C. And I know there, there's some others being organized, but that's all uh, that's all that I can think of right now. You mentioned them earlier, Mike, so I felt an obligation to show some, well, show some I just, pictures. Well, I, like I heard them. some of our students were getting together in certain locations, and my goal is to create a family. I'm trying real hard to do that, so when I see this, it makes me happy. This is awesome. Yeah. Keep them yeah. coming. Yeah. Yes. Keep, Everyone, yeah, well, hey, I'm, I'm not doing – I don't do anything. I just, I just kind of poke people. I'm like, hey, <laughs> you guys need to do something. Y'all need to do something. I saw Praveen say sometime in Philadelphia. Well, maybe one day I'll go back to Philadelphia since that's where I'm sort of from. Yeah, yeah. Ruth, as Ruth says, DC, Ruth is 
Ruth is taking care of the DC thing. She's got this so oh, she's got it locked. She's down. got this on lock. Way to go, Ruth. Take charge. And, uh, and Praveen, yes, Praveen, I'm putting you in charge of the Philly meetup. Um, so anyway, um, thought that I would share that since Mike brought it up. I will let's let's see. How do I there we go? All right, all right. So now we'll get into the questions. And these and, don't uh, have to be tech questions. Yeah, they don't have to be tech questions. You can ask me how old my cat is. <laughs> you can actually ask me how we spell Sonny's name or if we still spell Sonny's name the same way that we spelled it when she was born. If anybody wants to ask wow. that, That's I'll nice. answer that. Yeah, there, there might be a story behind that. So I'll only talk about it if somebody mine's, asks. Mine's visiting me. She's being real cute now. All right. So there were, some, there were a couple of questions that came in before I, I, I asked. Um, somebody... Uh, Somebody asked about CXO relevancy and wanted to clarify what CXO relevancy is. So I'll let you take that, Mike. I just yeah. can't find it right now. So CXO relevancy means relevant to the C-level executive officer. CEO relevancy, CTO relevancy, CIO relevancy, CFO relevancy, chief operating officer relevancy. C is architects. We're going to have to communicate and sell and listen to all these people. And what the CEO cares about is sure not the same as the IT manager. And it's totally different than the CFO. For example, on the CEO, I'm concerned about strategy. That's what I focus on. CEOs manage to focus on strategy. Now, in a publicly traded company, they also focus on revenue and profitability. The chief financial officer is focused on the, where the company's resources are. The chief operating officer is making sure things actually happen and get done. Because if you just have CEOs that build the strategy and no operations team, you've got beautiful PowerPoint slides, but nothing else. Yeah. And you've got great <laughs> ideas, which nobody manages to get done. So that's the key. And we have to train that because what I've seen is I've seen engineers walk in the CEO's room and they've been kicked out and fired because they didn't know what to say. And it's, it's not a, a minor thing, and it's a very common thing. If you don't know how to communicate to the CEO, you can't be an architect, because what do we have to do? Design things to solve business problems. So I'm always talking about that, because for us in architecture, it's not about the tech. Engineers about building the tech. For us, it's about solving a business problem. I can't do that without knowing what the, what the executives need. Hey, I finally found the question when you finished it. <laughs> that was a great question. I saw I saw that coming from Robert Timmons earlier. I just I can't really see and talk and remember what's going on everywhere. I can't even remember my own name. Oh boy. Uh, oh, good. This one I can't. I don't have to answer this one because the very end of it leaves me out. <laughs> so I'm applying for the MBA program at the university and plan to attend in the summer. What is something that you learned from your MBA program that provided the most benefit in your cloud career? A couple them. things, Josh. It looks real good on a resume. And I will say that is the primary thing that I learned. Mm -hmm. Now, having said all that, I did lean, learn how to read a financial statement in my MBA program, but I also learned that before because Cisco made me get it through executive training. I did study marketing in college, which I really, really, really loved that I was already working in marketing before I studied in my MBA program. But uh, that just sort of happened. Um, in my MBA program, they covered presentations, but not to the level of the presentation skills training that I had to take on the outside, but they do do that. And I think that's great. Josh, in my MBA program, what they did is they taught me writing. Now, unfortunately, they taught me the way not to write. <laughs> and Alonzo has an MBA and Chris has an MBA too, so they're more than willing to comment. In an MBA program, they tell you to write a 30-page paper. In reality, you have to you know, write a one-page paper for the CEO and a three-page paper for the yeah. executives and a 300-page and a paper for your engineers. Yeah. And they taught some project management in an MBA program, but I got to tell you, not enough to actually manage a project. What I would say the MBA program was for me, Josh, was a really good stamp on my resume. I would say that it was... Uh, a chance to refresh and fill in the gaps from the things that I've been doing in my career, which I think was very valuable. But since architects are consultants, 
it looks good to have an MBA in consulting, but I would say I got much more out of my own learning than I actually did out of the university. I find universities to be a little academic in what they do, based yeah. more based on theory versus what we actually do. But, you know, Alonzo, you have an MBA, and Chris, you have an MBA, so I'll, I'll see if you have a different perspective. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, not to echo what you said, it's like that was the biggest problem. Like, case in point for my MBA program, there were a lot of projects. And, and one of the things that's ironic how it's it, it echoes real life. You're going to have a certain project in your MBA program where you're going to have a team of folks who need to get things done. You have to start. Someone's going to have to take lead to disseminate what the expectations are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, how we can get this project done by everyone taking a chunk of this thing and being able to execute it on time and hypothetically within budget, depending on if it's a finance or whatever project. So when you think about it, it, and I would take lead most of the time, is that you have to deal with the time constraints. You have to deal with um, personalities. You have to deal with those who are not carrying their weight. you got to deal with those who want to take on too much. There's so many different facets of that. And I think um, Ayuk, he also spoke to that. I think that's a common challenge whether it's business or technical, is being able to ascertain people's strengths and weaknesses and how to manage that effectively um, while the project is going. So there's going to be times on a technical project where you're going to have to basically, uh, when you're on a, on a train and you're basically pulling the wheels off, changing them while the thing is still going, you have to manage the time. You have to manage the budget. You have to manage the personalities. You have to manage those who are taking time off. You have to manage cultural differences, especially if someone is practicing Holly on one particular month, someone is practicing Ramadan on the other, or there might be uh, a Christian holiday. So you have to manage all these things and incorporate that within the you know particular project. So those are some of the things that I learned some of it imitates life, but some of the things that you have might be a little um, pedantic, you know, if you will. And you have to, you know, make do with what you have. So if that makes, you know, chime, chime in, Chris or Mike, if that makes sense. But I, I think that's that's pretty accurate. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, I've always said. And I think it. I think it wraps it up a little too neat and nicely about what what you were just trying to describe, Alonzo. But I've always said that uh, it, it taught me. It taught me how to think, and it taught me how to deal with stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 it, yeah. It, without it taught me how to think. It taught me how to deal with stuff. I, I use stuff as a general term because stuff could be situations, people, organizations. It taught it just it, it taught me how to deal with stuff. <laughs> That's a good way to put um, it. And so that, and, so, uh, and I've always said that. That's what I've always said. When you know, whether it's you know, two years after I got my MBA or uh, 13, 13 years after I got my MBA, um, you know, it's it's still the same thing. It's still the same. Like I I couldn't tell you any one thing that I did in my MBA program, but. Yeah. I can tell you what I got out of it. Why well, it taught me how to deal with stuff. Um, I, I had a little bit of a different experience. I, at, at my at my university, my program, the MBA program was run by somebody who had actually been working, uh, <laughs> and who had actually who had actually worked uh, it, it outside of education before. Like they they got their they, they got their you know. Master, they got their master's and they got their PhD, but while they were getting their PhD, they were actually, uh, or, or while they were getting their master's and before they got their PhD, they actually worked. And, mm. and then they, you know, after a few years, they got, they got into the education profession because that's what they wanted to do. But they, they had that experience of an actual business. Um, but so I had a unique experience in that, that obviously they did, they weren't teaching every class in the program, but they made sure that the program was actually, uh, relevant like the 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 content that the the instructors of the courses were doing was actually actually relevant to real world and not all theoretical uh application you know and, and case studies out of a book um you know yeah. i had one 
it, it's funny. My, my wife was in the same MBA program and her, one of her projects for marketing and, and events and whatever, I, I can't remember the exact class. She asked and they said, yes. She, she said, can I do my wedding? Like, so my, my, our wedding, she actually got to do an entire case study on what mm -hmm. it took because we, she, we actually, you know, she did the planning, she did the marketing or the, all this dealing with all the salespeople, dealing with all the different vendors, dealing with that. She dealt it all herself. And she, she used that for her case study, real world example. So again, like I said, MBA program, it, it taught me how to deal, how to deal with things, how to think uh, through things. Um, it's the best way to put it, I think. Yeah, I, think, oh, yeah. I love that. Okay, Mike, please. I actually really love that because that's a really good way to put it. I did learn different ways of thinking and seeing perspectives, but you have to remember, I did my MBA program kind of twice. I did 75% I went at Drexel and then I got a job that was so good. I quit and just ran with the job. And then five or six years later, I kind of felt bad about not finishing the MBA. And when I was at Cisco, they paid for it and I did finish it. But you have to remember the kind of job that I actually had before I got into the MBA program was better than people would get when they'd actually get the MBA. So for me, you know, it was funny. In fact, I remember having one project and it was, it was a technology class and it was design a new and innovative solution. So I designed something that was exactly what I was working on at work. I turned it in and it had an F. The professor said, stop giving me science fiction. I said, this isn't science fiction. So I turned it in again and she said, it's science fiction. I actually brought her a sample of it running in a data center as a proof of concept and she said, Stop giving me science fiction. So uh, I, I reached yeah. out, of course, out with another professor because, you know, I didn't feel like dealing with her. I was too busy working and that's all that mattered. But yeah, I think you had a really good point there, Chris. There is actually... Yeah. Um, one There's a good one that I, I'm going to go out of order here, but yeah, I think I you saw the same. <laughs> Probably. Is it Badir's? It was actually uh, the second one Abish Sankar said because that one is... Yeah, so yeah. Let, let's... Uh, I was going to do Badir's and then go straight to that one. They're, okay, sounds good. Yeah, so, and I may be pronouncing it right, wrong, but our Badir, I'm not sure. I apologize. But since they're talking about education, he says, y'all, he must be <laughs> from Mississippi, like me. <laughs> but uh, he said, sorry for asking multiple times. I have a bachelor's degree with philosophy with some help desk experience. Is this a <laughs> hindrance? Or should I get a technical degree? No, don't get a technical degree. This is a perfect degree. Technical <laughs> degrees are not your friend because in technical degrees, they don't teach you communication. They don't teach you free thinking and open-minded things. So Badar, I'll tell you what my degrees are in. My, my first master's degree is in nursing. I'm a nurse practitioner and my second is in business. I've had no technology degrees for the last 25 years. I've been an architect for 25 years. When people are saying, Mike, I've got a bachelor's in computer. I want to get a master's. I say, no, get an MBA instead. So, no, you don't need a technical degree. I've never had one. Uh, in fact, I've had students hired by Amazon that don't have any degrees. But why? But I'll tell you one thing. Amazon cares about hiring the best and brightest. And the best and brightest don't always have degrees. Sometimes they yep. do. Sometimes they don't. But they hire the best and brightest. And you know what? No experience, they'll hire two if they're the best and brightest. So it's not about what your degree is in. It's not about what your certification is in. It's what your knowledge is, your capabilities, and what you can show the world. Yeah, I mean, my philosophy. I mean, that. Yeah, I was about to say. The, the, only, thing, the only thing that might be better is psychology when yeah. you're, dealing with, I, because you're dealing with people. But I mean, you know how to ascertain behavior, understand body language, um, nonverbals. You were able to apply hundreds, thousand year applications on human, on the human condition today and being able to package that in business as well as in IT, that's a dangerous comment. That's almost a triple threat to be yeah. able to do that. So continue on getting that, move forward, and you'll have a multifaceted positioning to be successful in, 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 in the cloud. From my perspective. Yeah. So, so an MBA yeah, so would that, be perfect and it doesn't matter what it's in. It's irrelevant. It's a stamp on your resume that we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Abis, before we get to the question that we wanted to get to from Abhisik, we're gonna I'm gonna answer this one because it needs to be answered right now. 
Should I pursue MBA in information technology? No. no. MBA in marketing? No. MBA in management? Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> MBA in management, because it's the, the entire idea behind a cloud architect role or any of these roles that we're dealing with in our community is managing. No matter what it is you're managing, you're managing something or yeah. someone, a situation, a person, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I took that one, Mike. I'll let you add to that if you want to. I, I agree with the management, but personally, I don't even care what it's in. It's, you're, you're looking for a stamp on your resume, but if you want it to be most yeah. appropriate, it should be management. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so now back to the one that, the other one that caught our attention from it. And this and the, one is really important, and I want to address this. In the U.S., everything seems to be customer service oriented, which you did not learn when you went to engineering school. So... I'm going to say this very clearly. The reason engineers almost never get hired as cloud architects without special training is they don't learn the customer service, the communication, the leadership skills. In fact, it's so bad that it's sometimes easier for me to get a nurse, a cloud architect job than it is a cloud engineer. So, Abish, Abish Sarkar, it's really, really, really important. In fact, I worked for a company that was headquartered in another country, in another country one that had a billion plus people. And they had the world's best engineers there. And they hired Americans and English people to actually sell the product and architect the product. Now, we didn't design anything in the back end. We weren't the smart people that did it. But we were the ones that were selling it. Behind the scenes, there were a bunch of super geniuses that were coding and configuring this stuff. But they wanted the Americans that were soft skills trained and the English people that were soft skills trained to close the big deals. So architecture's big deals where you're closing. So that's why in architecture, it's so critical to actually train these things. Yeah, and to, to piggyback on that, uh, I'm not, uh, based off of that question, it sounds like they may have gone to engineering school outside the U.S., just from mm-hmm. how that's phrased. Even if you went to engineering school in the U.S., you don't get taught not that. You, you wouldn't have learned anything about the customer service because it's not a engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer engineering, they're not, they're not, they're not worried about the customer themselves. They're worried about the, whatever the, the product is that they're engineering, whether it be a nuclear reactor, a car, or a, or, or a cloud service that they're, they're not worried about the end user as much as they are the, the actual thing that's being engineered. So it, that's the secret. Yeah, so, and that's why we keep recommending MBA. Yeah, like if, you, if you're if you're gonna get a master's, get it in business because it's geared around dealing with people, customers, end users, employee what, managers, etc. And that's when people say, "Hey, Mike, should I work in DevOps? Is it going to help me?" And I say, "No," and it's going to yeah. not help you for two reasons. It's going to teach you another person's career, which does not help you in your career, but also it teaches you another set of skills that are farther away from what you need. And then it's much harder to unlearn those skills to have the sales, the customer service, the emotional intelligence. So that's the reason people don't get these degrees with these jobs. And that's why we created the career development program, because people think they can get an elite job by doing tech, 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 but they can't. It's not about the tech. It's about what the tech can do for the customer. It's about solving the customer's problem. But guess what? We're people that we're dealing with and we've got to communicate to get it. I'm sorry, Cindy. As soon as this is over, I will take you outside and you can catch anything you want to catch. <laughs> oh, all right. So um, so here's a question for Mike. Uh, when you launched the GoCloud program, did you imagine it would be this impactful? And also, what is the future of the GoCloud program? So I'm going to preface this by saying, go watch episode 101 from two weeks ago, but we can still talk about it now because I love talking about it. <laughs> so, you know, Anton, what a great question. So, um, you know, when I've been coaching people for 20 years and when I started this, I thought it was going to be a small, fun thing I was doing in my retirement. In fact, I remember meeting with Chris. I had the company for a couple of weeks and then Chris is like, what are you going to do when you have a thousand people? I'm like, huh? I got 50. I'm having fun, Chris. Because he's like, people are calling you 24 hours a day. And I'm like, this is fun. I'm having a great time. And everybody was getting hired. And it was all kinds of fun and exciting. 
And then you were like, Mike, I think you've got more here than you realize. You probably need to put some structure to make sure this is going to work. And I'm like, I hate structure. I want to just do everything with my text message. And then a few things happened. We started doing all this free boot camps truly to help others. And the reason I did it was my friend Banjiko. I started giving away our free training because my friend Banjiko, who runs the War Fund Cloud, which was a group of really amazing Cameroonians, they were working on certification. So I started giving my certification course in ebooks away free for my friend Banjika and his students. And then that took on and we started working with more and more groups. And I got to tell you, I'm super excited. 50 of our people are volunteering to help Cloud Heroes Africa. I've got a student that gets hired at their first Cloud Architect job, literally speaking, every day of the week. Even people that are not our students that watch our YouTube videos, when we do our YouTube, say, guess what, Mike? I just got Cloud hired by watching your videos, studying your free interview stuff. So, you know, I am beyond excited. And I'm going to tell you, I've only focused initially on the cloud architects because that's the job world I know. But you know what? I was an engineer before I was an architect. And when I was teaching that CCNA and I got hands-on engineering, I went, oh, God, I miss my engineering days. So I reached out to some of the best and brightest people that I know. And we have a cloud engineering program that's going to be here on May 1st. And it's going to be amazing. Alonzo and I are putting it together. together, And we hired Linux engineers from Red Hat. We've got Terraform in here. We hired a developer to teach Python. We've got everything in here, and it's going to include our professional development. And there's nobody that's going to go through that program and not be cloud hired on the end. So we'll have that for cloud architects and cloud engineers. We also have a cloud Linux engineer program because guess what? Everything is on Linux. And Linux is one of the greatest careers for people that want to be hands-on in building some. So we've got a cloud Linux engineer program. And... Uh, there's another community that I'm part of, of some very, very, very special people. And we're going to have something to take care of some very special people that uh, take care and protect us and provide us safety every single day of the week, coming in May. And I'm real, real, real excited about this. All right. Uh uh, that is exciting. I was making sure you weren't going to throw anything else in there. It's like, hold on. I got to. All right. Yes, I know about this. Yes, I know about this. Yes, I know about this. I was like, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for you to throw something out there that I don't know about. <laughs> uh, you know what? We may do a free Azure Boot Camp one day soon. So uh, subscribe uh, to the and tell your friends to subscribe. Yeah. There, there it comes. All right. I knew it was going to happen. All right. <laughs> now, I don't know when we're going to do this, but at some point in the next year, I'd like to do one. <laughs> All right, so um, let's see here. Uh, um, I see a question I really want to get to. You like that? You like what's on my desk? I can't see what's on your desk. Oh, you, a minute ago, there was a tell. Cindy, here, uh, here, here, <laughs> here, here, here what we can do. This will be, I was going to fill up a glass. Oh, I saw, I saw something fly by. <laughs> Uh, so virtual ninja, uh, oh, hold on. Before I get to virtual ninja, uh, Danka, haha. -ha. Thank you, Danka. <laughs> so we don't talk about cats on the show. Actually, we talk about cats only on the show. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so Sonny is my cat. And since you asked about the spelling, I'm going to tell the story now, since this is a ask anything you've ever wanted to know. So uh, Sunny is my cat and Sunny is a girl and Sunny, her name is spelled S-U-N-N-Y. So there is Sunny. Sunny was not always spelled S-U-N-N-Y. Sunny was originally spelled S-O-N-N-Y, uh, like Sunny and Cher. Sunny, the male of the Sunny and Cher duo. We named, we named her Sunny after Sunny because we thought Sunny was a he. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, she, so she was Sunny with an O. Uh, and then we found out when we went to the vet to get her, her, her fixed, we, we found out that she was not a she. And so luckily we only had to change the O to a U. <laughs> And not confuse the cat because <laughs> she had gotten used to the name Sunny. <laughs> so I always find that story funny. 
because Sunny with the U is my sweetheart. She's my baby. And my wife will fight me for her. Uh, my wife says that she's her cat. I say that she's my cat. And then my wife reminds me that I didn't want her to begin with. So I feel Ooh. bad. Uh, I know. I was a dog, I was a dog <laughs> person. What, what can I say? So was I. But, now I'm a cat person. Yeah, now I'm a cat person. So that that's that is who Sunny is. So that uh, since you asked, I shared. Um, now, Virtual Ninja asked a question. It says, "Is there a shelf life for the NBA? If there is, how do you keep the business side live and fresh in your mind?" I have thoughts on this, but if anyone else wants to go before me. Mike, go. You lead, and then I'll I'll make a, a, a position myself. Well, what I'll say is a little different for me, because I did my MBA program, but I took much more elite training on the outside. So you know, when Cisco would bring in you know three days for five thousand dollars CXO relevancy training, and then three days later they had emotional intelligence training brought in, I would say that that was another level over my MBA program. At one point, they brought fighter pilots in and wanted a company to start talking about motivation, and who all had MBAs too. So I would say that on that, that's really where I learned these hardcore skills. So by the time I actually did my MBA, I had already closed a billion dollar deal. I had, you know, it, it was normal for me to just close big deals and be in the room with CEOs and CFOs. So I did the MBA just for me psychologically. I just wanted to say I did it. So. It, whatever it was part of me before the MBA was part of me after the MBA. But I'll tell you what, I did still remember how to do ROI modeling, how to calculate the expected value of an opportunity. I learned that in the MBA program, which was really good. And uh, the other thing that I learned in my MBA program is that I hate math. And that uh, it did teach me how to find my weaknesses, which what I would do is I would look for the person that looked like they were the best math person that was afraid to speak. And so you mean you didn't like probability computer. math, Mike? Oh, all of it. I don't like math, period. <laughs> I hate that stuff. Me too. Yeah, don't get me started on probability. <laughs> if you flip or roll the dice, <laughs> it's like you lost oh my God. there. <laughs> but what I will say, at least my perspective, is there will be things that you will learn that are valuable and those are the things you'll be using and they'll be the things you remember. Statistics show the average MBA graduate remembers 5% after five years. Yeah. But, Alonzo, uh, do you, any, any thoughts on that before I give mine, Alonzo? You're gonna learn, okay, with your MBA, you're gonna learn the fundamentals. You're gonna learn a lot of established philosophies, a lot of established uh, math, um, ROI modeling that they still use today. However, you have to stay innovative. You have to still look and seek out all the new business acumen. I mean, they've changed everything like, you know, it, it, you know, elastic cloud or versus this or that. All the terminology, all the culture continues to change. And then you have to consider applying domestic business with international business how that is how that works with americans with the british americans with indians americans with any type of other culture like say for instance what i learned i spent some time in japan i i did an immersion course and a lot of the differences that we have we speak with our hands we're very verbal we are taught to look that person in the eye so that they can understand that you are mm -hmm. forceful honest and focused in Japan, that is not the way to go. Okay, nonverbals, they do not like a lot of hand gestures. They don't look at each other's and, you know, look each other in the eye because that, that's considered rude and very confrontational. You will not close the deal with that type of uh, understanding. So it's those nuances that you can learn and further build upon the foundation of your MBA. The MBA is just a starting block. Yeah. But once you leave out of school and you start applying that knowledge, that's when you can keep it fresh because you're going to be immersed in trying to be successful in in business. And there's no way that you can be by using the same, you know, college try application. Back to you, Chris. Yeah. So I. Uh, 
there's there's two sides to this question for me. So I think that from a shelf life perspective, I'm thinking like on paper, there's there's no there's no there's no shelf life for an MBA on paper, um, unless you have not cannot show that you have been in positions that you've had to utilize the MBA. So if I were in, I, I, I can't even think of a position. If I were in a, uh, I'm just going to go to an extreme left field here. If I were a, uh, if I were a, a nurse assistant, let's just, uh, just <laughs> for 15 years after having gotten my MBA, is my MBA relevant? Uh, I, I, Probably not, because people are going to look at it and say, "Well, what have they? What, what have you done in the past fifteen years that have made you use that knowledge that you've you you, you accumulated with your MBA?" Uh, and that position might not be the right one, but uh, I'm trying to make make a point with that. But on the other hand, like uh, Alonso and Mike have said, the MBA is a starting point. Uh, the MBA. And the knowledge and the, the, the skills that you get when acquiring your MBA are just a starting point. Yeah. And when you're in positions that utilize what you've gotten from that MBA, it's expected that you will continue to build on that just by nature of being curious enough to improve yourself. You know, that, that, that's how it, you have to take it upon yourself to, to find the resources that will continue your improvement after that MBA. Uh, and it depends on what field you're in, you know, you, you, or what position you're in. You'll, you'll, in our field, <laughs> you'll want to subscribe to CIO magazine or, yeah. you know, equivalent, equivalent, equivalent magazines or, or publications. And through those, then you'll find, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll become aware of workshops and virtual conferences and things of that nature. And it, it's upon you. You know, your company may give you an expense budget. They may not. If you need to spend some of your own money, you need to spend some of your own money. It, it's upon it's it's up to you to 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 keep that going. Uh, there's no one size fits all answer to how to keep it live and fresh in your mind. You, you do it <laughs> and you use it and you keep improving it. I mean, it's uh it's just like any other skill set. You have to keep honing. You have to keep practicing your skill. So, and, and I really like the way you put it. It's the fundamental piece, and <laughs> uh, that's when when you do it. Sometimes as an adult, you already have some of the fundamentals, but if you don't, it's fundamentals. But you keep building on them, and I really love the way Chris described that. That was perfect. Uh, there we go. That's great. Congratulations. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, coming from, uh, all right, so let's see. William says, coming from a cybersecurity governance and compliance background, can this help me to become a cloud architect? Uh, William, here's what I'll okay, help I you. guess they're talking about the background. Okay. Will that background help them? William, I'll tell you what will help you become a cloud architect giving being an excellent presenter being relevant to the executive audience such as the cso's knowing how to perform roi modeling knowing how to sell knowing how to lead a team of 20 or 30 or 40 cloud engineers that are actually going to be doing a proof of concept for you giving presentations in front of a few thousand people and writing that will help you become a cloud architect and if you were a nurse yesterday i could have you become a cloud architect in eight months with that background absolutely Coming from a subject security and compliance background, same thing. We'd still have to teach you all those same things, which really means what would you have to learn? And well, William, it would be easy to do. You'd have to learn the network. You'd have to learn the data center. You'd have to learn the leadership skills, the sales skills, the presentation skills. And guess what? You'd have that job. Now, coming from a cybersecurity background is helpful because it shows his tech experience. What you'd have to do on your resume for this is you'd have to share the, how, the, how the tech experience is relevant. So as an architect, we don't configure. But as an architect, 
We solve problems. So what does that mean? So did you write any security policies? Because if so, that would be a cloud architect thing to do. Did you do any training for uh, basically any kind of anti-phishing or some social engineering? That would be the thing you're going to put on your resume that's going to show architecture. Did you speak with the executives at the company and design a firewall strategy for the organization, an IDS, IPS system for the organization? That looks good on them. Are you complying with regulatory laws? Great, which ones? Did you implement a new PSI DSS system that did something beneficial for the company? Those are the things. So William, for us as architects, it's not about the tech. It's never about the tech and that's why people don't get cloud architect jobs. They're so focused on getting this certification or this certification or this certification or this certification. When what we really need to do is focus on Mr. or Mrs. Customer, Tell me about your business and knowing so much about business that we know how to solve those business problems with technology. Then we have to write it up, present it to the customer, sell it to the customer. And then as soon as we're done that, guess what happens? Somebody else took over and we're done. So your background, sure, it's helpful, but it's not especially helpful. It's not like you were a network architect or a data center architect, but William, seriously, you could easily become a cloud architect. Easily, easily, easily. If I train you to be a cloud architect in about six months because of your tech background, but you can do it and there's no reason you shouldn't do it. And if that's something you desire, go become a cloud architect. Yeah. Yeah. My apologies, so, everyone. My internet is very unstable. So I, I apologize in advance for that. Oh, that's fine. It's just an opportunity for me to get put on the spot. You know, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... So, but R asks, which cloud provider does Sunny prefer? I think GCP, JK. I'll tell you one uh, thing. She is really good with OpenStack because she likes to power off my OpenStack servers with her pods. She likes to chew through <laughs> Ethernet cables. Oh, uh, that, she likes to unplug that's, Ethernet that, that, that's Cindy, not Sunny. Don't be trying to blame Sunny no, no, for no, that. This is my Cindy. <laughs> she also sometimes yeah. pulls power cables, which really scares me. Yeah. So, so they were ask, They asked about Sunny's preferred cloud, and Sunny's preferred cloud is whichever one her automatic cat feeder utilizes to give her her cat food. Mm -hmm. That's her favorite cloud. I, I haven't been able to determine which cloud that is, but that's her favorite one. Because otherwise, she'd have to rely on me, and I'm not the best at that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so Abbasik asks, does it matter where or which school to get an MBA? Yes. Yeah, so here's what I would suggest. You're either in the top 10, meaning London Business School, Harvard Business School, Columbia Business School, Stanford, or you go everywhere else and it doesn't matter. Go find the cheapest place you can find. That's what I did. Yeah. I, I went wherever my employer paid for it. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> but I will tell you the main uh, difference between the Ivy League universities and the non is they teach soft skills, emotional intelligence, and leadership skills and social cues there. And they don't do that at the public schools. No, they don't. Um, let's see. Josh asks, what's the best way to gain real-life management experience? whether it be broad projects or people for someone who is 24, where it is hard to get those opportunities based on the lack of experience. Josh, everybody's a leader or can be a leader. If you choose to be a leader, act like a leader, really focus on your emotional intelligence, really focus on bringing out the best in others, show up in team meetings and volunteer for projects. And when you get on projects, take the lead, you'll be, a manager in no time, but you've got to go show it. You know, when there's a team meeting and the manager's handing out tasks and everybody else is hiding under their desks, I got this. And when you get this, keep your manager informed, send your manager the information, bring a team. I need a few people and start leading them. When you go there, you need a team, buy them the lunch on the corporate credit card. All of a sudden people start following you around. You, you make your own position. You make your own luck. That's what I did. I wanted to be a manager. There were no options for me. So I acted like the manager. The next thing I realized, I was the manager. It's all about that branding, Josh. Um, 
at 24, they're going to assume that you're immature or you're yep. going to be just young. But if you present yourself in a well-mannered fashion, especially if you can execute emotional intelligence in a discussion and be able to somehow package that in a presentation to show what your capabilities are, they will look at you more closely and you will get that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are management experience is not something that you can do in a vacuum. So it's, it's more, it's not as easy as I don't want to say easy. It's not as, uh, you don't have the same opportunities that you have as being able to show your experience with uh, pieces of technology. Yeah. Um, so management experience, uh, first of all, it's going to take time mm. just by the nature of it. You, you can't, you can't take on a project and just be done with it. A, a right. project that shows your, that, that gives you the actual experience is not even going to be a project that you complete in an MBA program. Uh, no. It, it's it, it, that that's helpful, but it's just, it's going to take time. And like Mike and Alonzo said, it's going to take taking the opportunities that present themselves. Mm-hmm. Even I'll use a personal example of myself from the hotel industry. I started off in the hotel industry earning $8 an hour in the Mississippi Delta in a town of 10,000 people where there was two hotels <laughs> and uh, a, the hotel I started at had no management structure. So guess what I did? <laughs> started leading. I just took the opportunity that, to lead. Um, and it happened. And, you know, within a couple of years, I was director of operations for the, the company that managed that property. Uh, so director of, you know, assistant director of operations for 16 hotels. Um but I took that opportunity that presented itself and I was 24 making $8 an hour again. You know, I didn't stay making $8 an hour, but you know, that was also 15, 12 years, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, but um, you know, the opportunity presented itself, I had to take the opportunity and do it. So, so back, you know, what Mike and Alonzo were saying. Um, and I'm going to give you two examples, Josh, from my coaching career. The first one, his name is Delroy. He's one of my students right now in my leadership program. He came to me about a year ago. In fact, he just visited me on Saturday, so I I got to spend some time with him. He had been on 20-plus interviews for security jobs, and then within he took our course, and within a month, he had three job offers. Well, anyway, he started out as the newbie. First tech job ever. Then he got promoted to the not the newbie, some regular mid-tier job, and now he's the team lead. But... What did he do from the beginning? He said, Mike, what do I need to focus on? I said, your emotional intelligence, your communication skills, your executive presence, your relationship development, your body language reading, all that stuff in this career development program. And he got there because they saw him as the manager because he acted like a leader. Because these are the leadership skills that get you promoted. The next example was a kid I coached about 20 years ago. His name was Carell. Carell was a rock star engineer, really, really smart, had some kind of master's degree in engineering. I met with him the first time, and he was struggling to get where he wanted to go. He was wearing like this lime green shirt and some kind of wacky pants, and he was making a fashion statement. And I said, and he's like, Mike, what can I do? And I said, Carell, I said, hear this thing. I said, communication is everything. He said, that much? I said, yeah. I said, so we're going to do some soft skills training, some leadership training. You're going to go and act like, you're in charge. You're going to go buy a bunch of blue suits. <laughs> You're going to go a bunch of black suits with some white shirts. When everybody else is wearing a golf shirt, you wear a suit. And there's a project you volunteer for. It. He was promoted so far within the first year and a half by the time he was like 23 years old. So the key is nobody gives us opportunities. We have to make our opportunities. But all of this growth, all of it is the leadership skills. If you act like an executive, when I was 21 in school, I had a problem with one of my professors in the nursing program. I'd been a paramedic for like 10 years at the time or some ridiculous number like that. And I called the nursing program and spoke with one of the, de- the dean. And she says, well, Mike, you're older than the professor, right? And she said, the professor's only 29. I'm like, I'm not even 21 yet. But people thought I was older. 
In fact, Josh, at one point I was promoted into a very senior leadership position. And my manager said, I'm the youngest guy in the room. I'm 45, right? And I went to say, no. And then my, my executive coach kicked me under the table and she basically said, look, if they know that you're not in your 40s, that you're barely 30, you know, they won't think the same AU. So it's how you carry yourself and nobody will ever know if you carry yourself like an executive. Dress like an executive, walk and talk like an executive and lead people. You'll be a manager. Yeah, you know, and I have a seek asked to follow up, but I think there needs to be some clarification here. How can you create opportunity to show off leadership skills in order to get promoted? It's not a matter of creating it. It's a matter of seeing the opportunity, and taking it. Yeah. It, if we say, if we happen to say create, we, we, that's what we mean. We, we mean that opportunity is there and you've you got to take it. Um, because if you're not a lot of times you're not going to be in a position to create the opportunity, at least at the beginning of your, of your career. You get to see uh, it. If you, it, you can create solutions. If you see that there's an opportunity that needs a solution, then you can create a solution. You're still not creating that opportunity. You're, you're saying, Hey, this is something that can be fixed or this is something that can be addressed. Take it, do it. Um, uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts to that, Mike? So, you know, there's always opportunity if you don't see it. Right now, I'm looking at Alonzo. And if he was in the office, I'd look at Alonzo and say, hey, Alonzo, you doing okay today? Now, I know Alonzo just had dental surgery, but I could see it on his face. And if I walked in there and said, hey, Alonzo, you doing okay? You look a little tired beating up today. Is there anything, like, is anything I can do to lighten your load today, take over for you? All of a sudden, I've got a relationship with him. And then let's say, Chris, you're in the office and you're struggling with some cloud security thing. And I come over and I coach you and I help you with it. Guess what? Now I've got two allies. So that's what I started. When I did my CCIE, which I did in my first job, I had like these 10 routers and switches in my office. The next thing I realized, I, I had the whole company in my office and then I was tutoring them all. So <laughs> I started Sorry, you said they just said they just, yeah, said they just, just, said they just that. She's, she's communicating something to me that she wants to go out. But, uh, yeah. but you know, it was kind of that. So, you know, create your opportunity. There's always something. There's always somebody struggling. You go to a customer and the customer's not satisfied. Ask. Use your emotional intelligence. Train your communication skills. Soon, you'll have a following. But you can't do any of this without training your emotional intelligence, your executive presence, your communication skills, et cetera. Reading social skills, reading body language, without that, you can't move into management, and that's why it's so critical. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think unfortunately, uh, we need to call it a night. Uh, Alonzo's jaw is probably about to fall apart. And, <laughs> um, and Cindy appears to be ready to be done with the show. <laughs> yeah, Cindy's, Cindy's ready to go out there and chase all kinds of stuff. And thank yeah. you. And hopefully, not bring me any presents tonight. So, uh, hopefully, everyone enjoyed this uh, this episode. We will continue to come back on Tuesdays at six p.m. Eastern time. And now that I think everybody that is observing daylight savings time is observing daylight savings time, I think it's uh, I think we're all kind of back to normal. The UK is five hours ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it's been throwing me off all week. Yeah, yeah six o'clock Eastern, eleven o'clock UK time. Um, now we'll keep coming back, keep talking. If you have any uh, any topics that you want us to talk about, send us an email at admin at gocloudcareers.net or leave them in the comments after the show is over. So. I don't have anything else to add to the situation. I'll let you and uh, I'll let Alonzo say anything if he still has the the fortitude to speak, and then yeah, we'll let Mike close it out. Of them to take, but I, I'm always happy. I'm always glad to hear and, and just have a great time with everyone and with my buddies Mike and Chris. So, guys, keep coming. We've got plenty more to discuss. Plenty more things that we need need to get out on the table and discuss. So, um, I'll be. Uh, Back to 100%, hopefully, by next week. 
All right. And before I give it back to Mike, everybody that has any more questions, make sure to join us tomorrow morning for our YouTube Q&A that we do every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern. That's right. Uh, That's exactly correct. 2 o'clock UK and now 6.30 India Standard Time. So... We'll be back and take any career questions you guys have, and we will yeah. do whatever we can to help you guys get cloud hired or cloud exactly. promoted. Or just and we've got our interview it. session tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, please join us for that. Don't lose that. And if you want to be a cloud architect or get your first cloud architect job, take advantage of that 30% coupon code. We don't run a lot of sales. I don't, they only come when Chris tells me we're running them, so I don't even know. But I don't think we run a lot of them, Chris. So make sure everybody takes advantage of that. Hey, all right. Anything else that you want to add to it, Mike? Uh, I'll let you, I'll let you tell away, us goodbye Mike. when you're done. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being part of this community. You know, when I started tech a while ago, there were a bunch of us and we were all together and those were fun times. And, you know, we can have just as much fun on the cloud as we used to. Granted, the cloud's simpler and we don't need, it's not as complex, but guess what? That means we can focus on more. Focus on the customer more, more design work for the customer, and then we can become a true, true, true business partner to our customers. It's an exciting time for all of us. So it's been a real honor and a privilege to spend the evening with you. A lot of st my students are here. Thank you for coming. A lot of people that are not my students still, thank you so much for coming. We'll do everything can we can to roll around here at Cloud Hired. So look forward to seeing you next week. Please come back. We're thrilled to have you. Have a great night.